For this tutorial, we'll be using an example patch that produces a number of simple sounds, a pitch tone and two varieties of noise. You'll notice that our patch contains a subpatcher that contains both the selection logic and the sound generating part of our patch. We're going to create a preset system in this patch without naming user interface objects or using the auto patter object. Instead, we'll use a new max object called patter to name our parameters and expose them to the patter system. But first, let's begin by adding the patter object to our patch that lets us save and recall preset data, the patter storage object. The patter storage object uses an argument to specify a name for our collection of data. We'll use test tones as the name of our patter storage object. Let's open the client window for the patter storage object. It lets us view parameter data currently recognized by the patter storage object. Of course, the client window is currently empty because there are no user interface object exposed to it, but not for long. We're going to use the patter object now to name our parameters and expose them to the patter system. Type the word patter into a new object box, followed by a word you want to use as your parameter's name. We'll call this parameter noise type. Next, we'll bind the named patter object to the radio group object by connecting the middle outlet of the patter object to the inlet of the radio group object. You'll see an entry appear in the client window that shows the name of the parameter you entered as an argument along with its current value. We can use patter objects and subpatchers as well. Command double click on the patcher object called test noise to take a look at what's inside. We're going to add a patter object to save a pitch value for our test tone. As before, We'll name our parameter by entering a name in the patter object box as an argument, pitch in this case, and connect the patter object's middle outlet to the floating point number box. Notice that this data too appears in the client window. There's an entry that contains the name of our subpatcher, followed by a new line that lists data about the parameter name and value. We can add patter objects anywhere in our patch. The patter storage object automatically looks in the main patcher window and into any subpatchers, b patchers, and abstractions in the patch. That's not quite the whole story, though. To show you what I mean, I'm going to copy a b patcher from another file into our example patch. It's got a preset object, so it looks like our b patcher may have presets of its own. We can open a new view of the bpatcher's contents and look at it in patching mode to examine those contents more thoroughly. We can see that the bpatcher is already patterized. It contains its own patter storage object, patter objects, and a preset object as well. But take a look at the client window. All you can see listed for the bpatcher is the bpatcher itself and a listing for something called filter settings. Why can't we see the parameters in this bpatcher? We can't see them because when the patter storage object looks for parameter data to include, it stops looking whenever it encounters a subunit of the patch that contains a patter storage object of its own. The reason for this is that you may want to have the parameters for your filter not be recalled when you call presets in the main patch. What we see instead as the client window is an indication that there's a patter storage object in the bpatcher called filter settings. You can tell the patter storage object to automatically include parameters from the bpatcher by using a patter storage attribute called greedy. We'll add this attribute as an argument to the patter storage object in our main patch using the at sign followed by the name of our attribute, greedy, with no intervening space, and following that by the number 1 to indicate that the attribute is on. When we do this, the client window now lists all of the filter parameters in our bpatcher. The way we see the data listed provides us with a clue about how parameter data in a large, complex max patch is named. If a data parameter is in the main body of our patch, 
we identify it by its name, noise type, for example. In the patter system, the name of the subpatcher or B patcher and the name of the parameter are separated by a pair of colons. So, the name of the pitch parameter inside the test noise subpatcher is test noise colon colon pitch. The cutoff frequency in our B patcher is my filter colon colon cutoff. We can turn any bit of parameter data on or off by using its name. That is, we can enable or disable storing and recalling data for that parameter only as a part of our preset. Let's disable the pitch parameter in our test noise subpatcher by sending the message active test noise colon colon pitch zero. When we do this, you'll notice that the checkbox next to the parameter in the client window is now unchecked to indicate that this parameter is currently inactive. Sending the same message followed by a 1 instead of a 0 will enable the parameter and update the checkbox in the client window. Now let's turn our attention for a minute to saving presets. Sending the message store followed by a number stores the current state of our parameters with that identifying preset number. Let's create a second preset as well. Recalling a saved preset uses the same technique. We can send the message recall1 to recall our first preset. In fact, all you really need to do is to send the patter storage object an integer value and it'll do the same thing. But we're showing you the recall message because it's got some interesting features that we'll show you now and in our next tutorial as well. Now that we have a way to uniquely identify parameters in our patch, we can use those names to store or recall the data for any single parameter only by sending messages to the patter storage object. The message store followed by the name of a parameter and an integer that specifies the preset number will store parameter data as part of the numbered preset for only the parameter we specify. Let's store a new value for the noise type parameter for preset 1. To do that, we send the message store noise type 1. Similarly, we can use the message recall followed by a parameter name and an integer to recall only that specific parameter's value. In addition to being able to work with individual parameters in a preset on the fly, we can use preset parameters as the equivalent of receive destinations in our max patch. We can do this using another new object from the patter family, patter forward. Any data sent to the patter forward object functions as though you had a send receive object pair with the patterized parameter as the receive destination. Let's add a patter forward object to our patch and control the cutoff frequency parameter for our B patcher. When we create our patter forward object, we'll type in the parameter name as an argument, my filter colon colon cutoff. Now when we send number values to that patter forward object, the cutoff frequency in our B patcher will change. The other great feature of the patter forward object is that it lets us change the destination for our values on the fly by using the message send followed by the name of any patterized parameter in our patch. So let's change the patter storage object that we have to send values to the pitch parameter in the test noise patch instead of adjusting the cutoff frequency. If we open our sub patcher, we can now see that the patter forward object is sending data directly to the pitch parameter. When you create presets in a patterized max patch, you'll be prompted to save a text file with the same name as your patter storage object when you close the file after creating any new presets. If you save that file to the same folder as your max patch, it will automatically be loaded the next time you launch the patch. However, you may want to explicitly control saving and loading preset data yourself. Sending the message right followed by a symbol that specifies the name of a file to the patter storage object will write the current state of all your preset data to an external file. This feature can be very useful for maintaining multiple sets of preset data for a single patch. To read in a file of preset data, 
you use the read message followed by the name of your file of preset data. You may not always want to have to manually save files when you close your patch. The Patter Storage Object lets you use a pair of attributes to control how Patter data is saved and restored along with your patch. You can find these attributes listed in the Patter Storage Object's Inspector. Normally, the Patter Storage Object will automatically try to find and read the last preset data file you saved. If you set the value of the Patter Storage Object's Auto Restore attribute to zero, the Patter Storage Object won't try to automatically load a file. Instead, you can include methods to load files manually as a part of your patch. The other attribute we're interested in is the Save Mode attribute. In its default setting of 1, the Save Mode attribute sets the Patter Storage Object to always prompt you to save a preset file if any new data has been created since you last opened the patch. If you set this parameter to a value of 2, the Patter Storage Object will automatically save the preset file without showing you a dialog box. Now that we've set these two attributes for the Patter Storage Object, let's add a new preset to our file. You'll notice that when we save and close our file, we are not prompted to save the file of preset data. In our next tutorial, we'll be looking at preset morphing. Until then, happy patching!